Corporate Hound Dar and Croiso. Uh, good afternoon and welcome to this multi-location meeting of the Community Finance and Strategic Leadership Committee on the 5th of September 2024. I am Councillor Phil Rogers and I will be chairing this meeting. Thank you all for joining us. Please could you ensure that your phones are switched to silent for the duration of the meeting. And in addition, when asked to raise your hand, if members who are virtually viewing this meeting could raise your electronic hand and for members in the chamber, just raise your hands. Thank you. On to agenda item two, declarations of interest. Can we take any declarations of interest, please? Okay. Uh, Councillor Reynolds, please. I, I don't, I, I'm not sure I am making a declaration of personal interest simply because uh, I will be raising some issues about one of the items which mentions the SPF and uh, the organisation I'm a trustee of is a recipient of SPF funds. It's not capital, well, not a large amount of capital, but it's still recipient of SPF funds. Thank you, Councillor Reynolds. Uh, agenda item three, the minutes of the previous meeting. You'll see the minutes attached at pages five to 14 of your agenda pack. Do we have any comments on the minutes of the meeting, please? I can't see any indication. If you feel that these minutes are accurate record of the meeting, I'm happy to propose them. Can I have a seconder, please? I'm sorry. Thank you, Councillor Hinton. If members do not indicate to the contrary, then I will take it that these minutes are approved. I can see no indications to the contrary, Chair, the minutes are approved. Thank you, Alison. We're into part one now then, next. Uh, agenda item four, to consider the items selected from the Cabinet Forward Working Programme. We'll now move to consider the reports as selected by this committee for consideration. The first one up is agenda item 4A on procurement strategy. Sorry, it's over the page. Yeah. Uh, Cabinet member, uh, Councillor Noyle, have you got anything you'd like to add, please? Thank you, Chair. Nothing further to add. I think Craig is going to take um, this item. Thank you, Councillor Noyle. Uh, Craig, if you'd like to come in, please. Thank you very much, Chair. So um, this is our procurement strategy for 24, 20, from 2024 to 2028. It's the first time we've actually created an overarching procurement strategy, which sets up the overarching strategic goals that the Council is going to adopt in respect of procurement. Whilst we had various different policies and protocols in different ways, for example, ethical employment practices, modern slavery, dare and all of those different elements this is the first time we've tried to link everything together under an overarching procurement strategy document which will form the basis then of the council's procurement activities um, throughout the next four years what we've tried to do is link it into not only all of the various strategic objectives that the council has already set by way of its corporate plan and its well-being objectives but also as well to make sure most importantly it tallies with all the legislative requirements that sit around procurement and the various processes that we've got to follow procurement is a heavily legislated area where there are various different restrictions and rules that local authorities have to forward. So whatever we do, we need to make sure it falls into account with all of those requirements that are there. And what we have seen over the last couple of years, and particularly in 2024, legislative reform is changing quite significantly in respect of procurement. As we've moved away from some of the European rules and we've had the implementation of what is now the Procurement Act 2023, there's new obligations and new processes that we need to follow in that regard and we are going to be in the process of designing our new standing orders for contracts surrounding those and that will be coming to members in the course of October for oversight and scrutiny and then on for final approval but what this strategy is mostly about is how we can demonstrate that not only are we meeting some of the legal obligations which Welsh Government have also set us in respect of socially responsible procurement but we're making sure as an organisation and from a local government's perspective we've got a strategic priorities in respect of how we are going to approach our activities and the way in which we've decided to structure it are the creation of what we call socially responsible procurement objectives which i've included in the report and they highlighted a paragraph 14 in your report papers. I'll just give you a quick overview as to what we're referring to with each one. So we've got securing value for money, quite an important um, element that we've got to take forward. Obviously, budget pressures being what they are, we need to make sure that we're getting value for money for any arrangements that we are commissioning externally. 
think NPT first, I came up with that particular slogan, and the way in which we're looking at that is, legally, we are not in a position where we can ring fence certain contracts to one locality. We've got to ensure transparency and give all opportunities on the market to bid for it. But what we're asking officers to do is when they are designing procurement processes and when they are thinking about their commissioning arrangements, they make sure that there are no barriers ultimately in place in respect of local organisations. So they are designing processes, they're designing systems, they're locking it down maybe into smaller contracts which people can be bid for and making sure that at the forefront of their decision making they're trying to promote neat but all but local organisations to make sure that investment back into the community in respect of where we are working with our activities are. Quite importantly, contributing to make Neath Talbot net zero by 2030 in line with all our other decarbonisation programmes. So making sure that we embark in on sustainable procurement, which is considering all our various different environmental issues that we need to be going at there. Improving fair work and safeguarding practices, we'd already signed up to our ethical employment in procurement processes and modern slavery requirements. Again, what this is making sure is that ethical arrangements and workforce issues are contributed as part of all of our commissioning activities as well. Quite importantly, making procurement spend more accessible to local small businesses in the voluntary and community sector. We want people to know how we are spending money in different ways and having transparency. So if there are opportunities that people want to bid for, they know there will be contracts available for them. We will be having a uh, public contracts register, you may have heard me mention before, which will have details of all our contracts that are entered into when they're expiring. So people will be able to see what opportunities are coming up and they can start thinking about if they want to bid for them and put themselves in the position so there's much more transparency to the market in what our activities are going to be going forward. Increases social value in procurement and benefits to the community. You may have heard before we have what we call community benefits ultimately in contracts um, where, for example, large scale contractors will offer um, apprenticeship schemes, training opportunities. They've done different work programmes in the community, continue to implement that as part of our requirements as well. And making sure that for all contracts over a certain value, which is set by Welsh Government, we've got those clauses intrinsically built in. And finally, quite an important one for me, ensuring legal and regulatory compliance in transport and transparent governance in respect of procurement, but also taking advantage now of some of the new digital solutions that are available, how we can make it easier ultimately for people who want to undertake work with the council and make sure that there are new ways of working so we can take advantage of some of these innovative practices in how we embark on our procurement activities. And we are now in a process of trying to develop the systems to, once the strategy improved, implement them throughout the council. And that will be in a number of different formats, such as template documents, guidance, training. It's going to be led by Sarah Foster, our procurement manager, who's in the room here with me today. And we will be trying to get all the sections on board as part of these requirements. And our first step, as I mentioned just now, will be our new standing orders in respect of contracts, which will come before members in October, ready for us to start implementing. But we are now moving on a new journey in respect of procurement, which came about to some of this legislative change. So this strategy will be the first part of the process to set those objectives. And we can make sure that our activity then is enshrined in those basic obligations chair so i'd be happy to take any questions members have many thanks uh, craig that's excellent we'll now move to members questions i've had a couple of indications already and first up i have councillor reynolds please thank you chair and thank you craig uh you've answered some of some of my questions <laughs> um so uh, it is very much a case of you know I, I don't need to ask in detail what I asked, uh, what I put forward at, at pre-briefing, which was about what exactly is different about this. But um, uh, I will flag up my concerns about uh, there's paragraph 19 on page 22 running into page 23, which is in the the uh, uh, the over overarching document, which. I found really hard to read about valid, Valley's community's impacts and actually didn't appear to tell me much about except for, for statistics. And I was, you know, I, I, I didn't think it actually indicated much about Valley's community impacts. Um, but I also uh, would pick up on following what you said. Uh, I have experience of contracts from both sides, yeah, from both sides to a certain extent now. Um, and my experience as uh, someone bidding for contracts with this authority has been, uh, pre being a councillor, has been that 
whilst we had lots of things that said we would do some of the things that are already under the small business and the voluntary sector, they actually didn't happen. So we're saying them and we're saying them clearly in the strategy, which I'm pleased to see. But what's what are we going? Are we actually going to do that? Are we going to give enough time to small organisations to come together in groups and cooperate? Are we going to allow time for coordination to happen so that various organisations can work together on a contract and things like that, which was always talked about and mentioned as something, but never quite happened? Thank you, Councillor Reynolds. I'll, I'll bring Craig back in, please. Yeah, and thank you for the questions, Councillor Reynolds. Um, good to know that I've read your mind in that sense that I answered some of those things. I was trying to work out how I could best explain some of this document to, to members, and I thought setting up the strategic objectives would be the best way in which to do that. Taking paragraph 19, I, I can see where you come from. It is quite technical and with some statistics in there, and it may not necessarily reveal a lot of this information, so I apologise for that. I think I must have written it, and I've read it back so many times, and it made sense to myself, but somebody looking at it from an outside perspective may not have looked at it. The gist of what we're trying to get through, though, with that is that whilst we do have some spend in respect of valley communities, valley communities, it is a relatively small spend when you look at it overall. But where we are spending that money in valley communities, it is going to SMEs and it is going to those sorts of organisations, VCS or whatever the case may be. So that was the gist of what we were trying to get across. Obviously, I could tidy up wording to make that a little bit clear. But absolutely, I take on board your points, what you're saying. It's all well and good saying one thing in a document. We've got to make sure we give and breathe it and we implement it going forward. So what you are going to see, hopefully, in the new um, procurement rules that we are developing and the standing orders is more of an onus on officers to think about time scales. They will have to actively can give consideration to certain factors to be in compliance with those rules when we are putting the documents out. And one of the things we'll be asking to develop is what we call the procurement planning document, which is highlighting how they've considered these factors why they are doing it in a certain way, why certain time scales are being followed. So we've always got a rationale to explain why that would be. And by encouraging people to have more engagement with our procurement team, we can make sure that we are taking all of those issues into account and embedding them as we go. So this is the start of the journey by making sure it's codified and it's written down. The standing orders and the documents we will be providing is the next stage. And then we will be working with officers to make sure that it's enshrined with all of the activities going forward. Thank you, Craig. Councillor Reynolds, would you like to respond? Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, next up, I don't know whether it's already been answered. Uh, I have Councillor Sean Percy. Thank you. Um, yeah, no questions on this one, Chair. Dale. Thank you, uh, Councillor Percy. Sorry, uh, I have next up Councillor Patterson. Thank you, Chair. I didn't ask this in pre brief, so I do apologise for that. Um, it's just a wording. Um, Securing value for money, um, it, it's a bit subjective. Um, I don't think it's clear. Members of the public are going to re read this and they may think the cheapest. Now, I'm hoping it's not just the cheapest, but I think a little um, not necessarily the lowest. You know, um, what's the word? Sorry, I'm missing the word. Uh, when they act, they bid. Not necessarily the lowest bid, but the one that's going to give us as a council um, spending money on the on the public's behalf the most bang for our buck. Um, I don't know how to word that, but I, I would just prefer something that explains to anybody that's reading it. It's not the cheapest necessarily. It could be the cheapest, but it might not be. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Patterson. Uh, Craig, do you want to come back in, please? Ironically, I was writing this this morning in that sense before I started my day about what value for money ultimately means, because in our standing orders, we will have a definition of what value for money will be. So I can just tell you that the way it's worded and it matches the Welsh Government's policy direction at the moment is rather than just being focused primarily on cost, value for money in arrangements should be considered as the optimum combination of whole life costs in terms of not only generating efficiency savings and but good quality outcomes for the organisation, but also benefit to society, the economy and environment both now and in the future. But whilst cost will undoubtedly be a factor, it will require consideration of a number of different issues in that sense. So that's going to be a rough definition, a bit of perfection that needs to be done on it. If I may check, that, that, that's why you're sitting there and I'm sitting here. Uh, but thank you for that. I'm, I'm pleased to hear that it's going to be a little bit more than just the few words. Thank you. 
agriculture person. Is, is that it? Yep. Uh, I can see an indication uh, online from Councillor Sarah Thomas, please. Hiya, thank you. Sorry, I can't go on camera because I'm in I'm in Glenwood Car Park at the minute. Um, but what I will say, I, I noticed that there was no mention of the Trading Standards Approved Traders List, and I think it would be really good if we could throw a little bit of uh, credit their way and, and direct towards that and at least have a preference for any any traders that we use to be on that list, even if it's not a, a full-on requirement. I know there's some resistance to that. Uh, thank you, uh, Councillor Thomas. Uh, Craig, please. Absolutely. We're doing a little bit of work at the moment in respect of what is commonly referred to as the select list, which people may have heard referenced before. Rather than looking at enshrining that in a procurement strategy, what we're trying to do is make sure that those opportunities are covered in the standing orders that will be going forward. So um, individuals, um, when they're looking at commissioning activities, they look to use those elements. So that would be the format in which we would look to try and address that particular point, Councillor Thomas. But I take on board the point about how we encourage that element is something certainly we've got to give some further thought to. And Thank you, Councillor Thomas, would you like to come back in? No, that's fine. Thank you very much. Lovely. Thank you very much. Are there any other questions on this item, please? I can't see any indication for it. Uh, so we'll now move to the recommendation, which is listed on page 16 of the agenda pack. I'm happy to propose it. Can I have a seconder, please? Second, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Henton. Uh, can members please indicate if they wish to abstain? I can see no abstentions, Chair. Thank you, Alison. Um, members, if you do not indicate to the contrary, then I will take it that this recommendation is supported. I can see no indications to the contrary, Chair. The recommendation is supported. Thank you very much, Alison. We're moving on now to part two, agenda item five, to consider items from the Scrutiny Committee Forward Work Programme. Uh, there are no Scrutiny Committee Forward Work Programme items to be considered at this point. Moving to part three, agenda item six, which is performance monitoring. We're now going to move to consider the performance reports as selected by this, this committee for consideration. First up is agenda item 6A, which is the Welsh Language Standards Annual Report 2023 to 2024. Simon, can I ask, have you got anything you, uh, further you'd like to add, please? Yeah, thank you very much, Chair. Uh, the report before scrutiny members today is the Welsh Language Standards Annual Report covering the period 1st of April 2023 to March the 31st, 2024. Summarises the work that Neath Patawa Council did during that time to comply with the standards. The Welsh language standards promote and facilitate the Welsh language and ensure that the Welsh language is not treated less favourably than the English language in Wales. The Welsh language commissioner issued a compliance notice on the 30th of September 2015, indicating which standards apply to our council. Compliance notices are unique to each organisation, reflecting the linguistical profile of the, of the local community and organisational capacity to meet the standards. Under the standards, the Council is required to publish an annual report by the 30th of June each year. Due to the pre-election period and the resulting impact on our reporting arrangements, it wasn't possible to present the 2023-2024 annual report to Cabinet within the given timescale. The annual report was presented to Cabinet on the 7th of August and subsequently published on our website the same day. This report recognises that complying with the Welsh language standards continues to be challenging and that we still have more to do before compliance becomes second nature. That said, our progress in a number of areas is encouraging and this was highlighted by the Welsh language commissioner during the year when our compliance was assessed as good, particularly in relation to telephone calls, corporate identity, which, inc which includes our corporate social media accounts and in complying with all the sub supplementary standards. With our revised Welsh language promotion strategy, the WLPS, published in September 2023, to complement the Welsh in Education Strategic Plan, WESP, we are confident and determined that progress will continue to be made in the awareness, acceptance, confidence and use of our beautiful language. So, Chair, like the following three items which we will take, we are happy to take any questions which uh, Karen and Anita here to help me with today. Thank you very much. Many thanks, uh, Councillor Noyne. Uh, we'll now move to members' questions. And my first indication is Councillor Padson, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just would like to know that it, it's pleasing to see that we've got, you know, we're doing, we're going in the right direction. Do we have any um, statistics to sort of 
say we're doing the right things, that it, it, use of Welsh is in, increasing or anything like that, that what we are doing is actually having a result then, basically. I'm going to pass you to Anita to answer the questions. And okay. Anything that's good that comes, needs to come Yeah, that's fine. Then we'll yep. take it from there. That's yep. okay. With, with all of the questions, we'll do the same. Oh, I'll address them. Okay, thank you. Th th thank you, uh, Councillor Patterson and Councillor Noyle. Um, we'll wait. Anita, are you ready? Okay, thank you. Yeah. Over to Anita then, please. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Patterson. Um, yes, yeah, so you will see in the report, um, there is some anecdotal um, information regarding the use of Welsh um, on page five of the report. Um, so that's saying we, we saw a small increase. The actual statistics we collect are to do with um, Welsh speakers. So that will be people who indicate, um, you know, their level of fluency. So at the moment we look at, um, you know, fluent Welsh speaker, fluent Welsh speaker and writer, fairly fluent, um, little or no knowledge and learner. Um, so we have all the information for those um, from from those. Um, the other thing, you know, we know that we have done, we have started um, to use Welsh more internally. Um, so, for example, with the employee engagement survey, we thought it was very important to offer a choice of that um, a choice in English or Welsh so that people had their chosen language to fill it in. You know, it's very much in this, this first year, so we really want to in encourage people to fill that in. Um, so we can have a look at things like how many people people filled that in in Welsh, but obviously that will come into next year's report. So um, the actual, there is some anecdotal evidence as in, you know, we, we have um, had events where we've had simultaneous interpretation, internal events this year, um, but the actual statistics really it will be the employee survey next year in terms of numbers and the number of people actually um indicating that they are welsh speakers um and also there's the, the number of people who are on the welsh speakers list in terms of answering phone calls etc okay thanks so, thank you anita can i bring uh, Elsa Patson back yes, in there please thank you thing. Thank you very much. Uh, next up, I have uh, Councillor Sean Percy, please. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, just two points on this one for me. Um, the first one is in relation to page four um, of the annual report, which I think is on page 80 of our agenda pack. Um, I, I was glad to see the paragraph at the bottom of page four referring to sort of instances around um, some of our publicity and engagement where compliance with the standards has been um, you know, perhaps impacted on that. And, and I, I think I know some instances this might be referring to um, where we've had sort of very lengthy questions on impact on Welsh language sort of popping up on um, external consultation documents. So I just wanted to pick that up and and, and just, just say sort of two things. First of all, I'm glad we've recognised that's an issue because um, certainly the way I've looked at it is it almost seems like in some of those instances we'd misinterpreted maybe internal checklists for decision making as in, is this decision going to impact the Welsh language? Um, which we then asked the public, um, which just didn't seem appropriate to me when um, when I'd seen those. So I'm glad that's been looked at. And and if officers do have any sort of um, information on on what's come of that, I'd, I'd really appreciate that because um, it, it's surprising how much of an impact it can have. It can kind of put people off a bit if we're seen to be um, sort of needlessly kind of... Uh, um asking asking questions rather than focusing on perhaps some of the meaningful impacts we can we can we can do on the welsh language so so that that was that point and the only other one i just wanted to pick up on um was on page um let's see if i can just um find that sorry i haven't got uh page six um and, and it's just more of a point to clarity really in terms of um Council meetings is referred to there. Um, I think it might be more appropriate to to make it clear that it's full council meetings only where the simultaneous translation. You know, Dyson Cavle here to the old camera. Like there's no opportunity to use Welsh here without having to translate it myself. So I think we should be clear in the uh, report that where we, we are offering simultaneous translation, it's it's currently limited. Um, and it's not really acknowledged there. It's obviously very welcome in full council, but um, I think we should acknowledge that that is currently um, limited. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Percy. Uh, Anita, would you like to respond? Yeah, thanks, thanks, Councillor Percy. So I'll take the question first regarding the um, standard questions around the impact on the use of um, Welsh and treating Welsh 
um, as favourably as the English language. So we have got duties under the policy making standards to consider the impact on the Welsh language for any decisions we make about exercising our functions or conduct conducting our business. Um, the questions we use are taken directly from the Welsh Language Commissioner's Good Practice Advice document. Um, but we have obviously recognised that that some people are, are dropping out, as you say, at, at those questions sometimes. So we've been trying different ways of laying out those questions to make them more user friendly while continuing to ask for the required information because it is really important information to collect. Um, it is now part of our IIA process. And I think like other things in the IIA, we can't assume that we know that there's not going to be an impact. So unless we ask people, um, we can't assume that there won't be. So I think that that's why it's really important to ask those questions. Um, but the other thing that we have done, because we are trying to set them out so that people don't feel overwhelmed and lose interest. The other thing we've done, we've drafted an explanation to go into future surveys as to why we're asking the questions. Um, and this outlines our commitment really and the duty to consider the impact of the Welsh language, but also stresses that it's the respondent's choice whether or not to answer them. But it does encourage them to do so because it will help us to consider all viewpoints. Is that all right for that question, Councillor Percy? Councillor Percy, yeah. Yeah, I suppose if, if if it's an unavoidable, you know, um, duty for us for us to do that, then I think we've just got to, as you say, you know, make every effort to, to sort of present it in a way that isn't isn't too off put in. I think, um, you know, if if there was discretion for us to to uh, you know maybe kind of screen whether we need to ask those questions, <laughs> almost it, it, in some sense it, it, it would be um, it, it would seem more sensible. I, I think back to like you know looking at improving recycling rates well what's the impact on the Welsh language you know I, I I question the value of that of a decision like that um of asking those questions as opposed to you know fundamental um uh service reform that 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 may you know uh, be more likely to to impact it but obviously if we're just working within the framework we're working within then we've just got to make the best of it and I, I appreciate that thank you Councillor Percy uh, very clear there Anita would you like to come back in for the second uh part Sorry, sorry, Councillor Percy. <laughs> yeah, with regards to the point on page six, yes, that should read full council meetings. So we've taken some advice on it. And as it's a typographical issue, we can clarify that in the report and and get it republished and amended. So thank you. Many thanks, Anita. I'd, uh, I'd like to bring Nigel in at this point as well, please. Yeah, just my need uh, so a question at the Council of Percy Governing Lina. Uh, a premium cover body. So, just like to make a, an observation really on the question asked by Councillor Percy regarding uh, instantaneous translation at meetings, and it is at the moment restricted to full council only. So, um, for me, that per that restricts your opportunities as elected members to ask questions or to have a conversation in Welsh at um, at these public uh, committee meetings. Um, and it's something that I'm keen to look at in, in the future to see how much, obviously, there's a cost involved with um, the simultaneous translation. However, um, I'd like to quantify what that looks like. And then there's a conversation to be had with regards to um, the importance we put on uh, allowing um, councillors and officers to speak in Welsh at, at public meetings, which clearly is is the right and just picking up on another um, observation thing, picking up on the question maybe by Councillor uh, Patterson there with regards to uh, you know um, statistics really around the use of the Welsh language. You, for me, what's important is that we create a culture and an environment that allows people to feel safe and comfortable in using the Welsh language. Um, so I've held a couple of staff conferences where I've um, spoken in Welsh and we've had a translator there so staff get used to hearing somebody speaking Welsh know if there are Welsh speakers in the room it's okay for them to speak Welsh as well so um, it's important that we encourage conversational Welsh um, in, within the workplace um, but also I'm keen to look at at the moment we define the use of the Welsh around fluent or not fluent you know my fluent Welsh could be different from your fluent Welsh however we could both have a conversation in Welsh um, and I think we need to move, look to move towards um, what is within Welsh language standards around, uh, you know, 
where you sit in terms of from from level level one to level five of using the Welsh language. Level one would be Bolada, Diolch, Good morning, th thank you. For example, up to being a very fluent level Welsh speaker, level five. So I think those are the areas that we can look to um, progress in the future, and hopefully that will make a difference in terms of our use of the Welsh language in East Patalba Council. Diolch. Many thanks, Roy. I, I think I'll class myself as level one at the moment, with a view to moving higher. Is that okay? Uh, can I bring the leader in now, then, please? No, <laughs> thank you, Simon. Simon said, I'm not going to speak Welsh now, am I? Uh, I wish I could. Um, my three children are fluent Welsh speakers, and uh, I just want to add my weight behind Noel when uh, looking at uh, opportunities, you know, and I think Sean is a, an example as a councillor who's uh, is moving very quite rapidly in the Welsh language, and I, I think it's key. It's, it's our national language, and it should be used as best we can. But you will know from me, I'll, I'll give some of the pitfalls and, and because looking at the stats, they remain the same. And they have done since we went out on a launch of the Welsh language and the Welsh government's own targets. By a, and I'm sure they've fallen very short of that. And we brought in and spent a lot of money to, to train and, and learn and, and we're still not moving forward. But I'll give you, it's a society problem, isn't it? When I mention my three children are fluent Welsh speaker, my daughter will continue to be fluent Welsh speaking because she's working in a Welsh school as a teaching assistant. My two sons, however, hardly use the language because of the environment they work and live in. Uh, and that's the difficulty. And I love to hear them speaking Welsh in the house, but uh, two, two have left. And so, so th I think there's a a fundamental problem here, uh, and there's certain parts of Wales, isn't it, like down in Carmarthen uh, uh, and uh, North Wales in particular, mm -hmm. and, and, and I will know a lot more than me about this, and sometimes there's different types of Welsh that they used as well. And I remember the farmers and all that, they had, they had the, the Valley Welsh, and everybody, because I used to, if you hear me, sometimes I go Dabo now, isn't it? And uh, I don't even know if that was a Welsh word, but but I heard it Dabo here, isn't it? And, uh, but no, I, I just want to agree with Noel when uh, that how important the Welsh language is and for Neath Talbot to continue driving and hoping we can improve the standards uh, and the use of the Welsh language. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Leader. Yes, I, I think um, it's a longer term plan with the, the WESP as well and more bilingual and, and Welsh language schools coming on board. I think in longer term, you know, we'll have more people doing conversational Welsh just in natural society, which we don't, I know in my area, I don't hear a lot uh, where, where I'm from at the moment, not, not in Carrick story on anyway, sorry. Yeah. So, uh, Councillor Percy, you were on. Is there anything you'd like to come back to at this moment? Uh, on on any uh, to say you know, you know guys down no one good, good work and I'm obviously looking forward to seeing uh, progress um, on that front but we're definitely working towards the right direction. Dear. Thank you, Councillor Percy. Um, I have an indication from Councillor Reynolds. Please next. Um, coming coming from somewhere where I hear Welsh language spoken every oh, day. <laughs> They're, they're, they're destined to look after me today, and there's no need for it. I just couldn't see the <laughs> green lights. Thank you, Paul. Um, don't sit with women, I tell you. <laughs> but um, no, we're uh, uh, and, and I hear lang Welsh language spoken every day. Um, and as the only uh, non-Welsh speaking governor of a Welsh medium school, I find it quite difficult and embarrassing that I have no, never been able to learn sufficiently to to say much. And when I did, I was ridiculed for speaking. And I'm wondering whether that's got something to do with the statistics uh, that we see here, because you've got the numbers identifying overall as fluent or fairly fluent, unless there's Unless there's a double counting, even if there's a double counting, but you know, of, of people you know saying I'm fluent speaker and I'm a fluent well, Welsh writer, I don't quite know that may be the case, but um, there's a larger number overall, quite a high larger number overall, uh, of uh, identifying as being fairly fluent or fluent than the number that appear in the directory, according to this listing, and whether that's a confidence issue or what's going on there, that's of concern. Back in, Anita, please. 
Yeah, thank you, Councillor Reynolds. I think, yes, it is, it is probably partly down to confidence. Um, I think the other thing with that, and maybe we should be more explicit in the report. Um, so the page 13, where we have the number of staff with fluent language skills in the directory, the directory only picks up those staff who are actually in jobs where they answer for the phone or have Office 365, so are online. Um, iTrent asks that information, I think, of all staff. So there will be frontline staff who won't be on the directory because they are not required to answer phone calls um, who will be in that larger number of Welsh speakers. So that is, I think that is a big part of it. But I think you're right to think confidence plays a part as well. Councillor Reynolds. I, I don't under, you know, they're not on the directory. Now, are we talking about the directory that I would see as a councillor? Or are we talking about the public directory? Because if it's the directory I would see as a councillor, if I was a Welsh speaking councillor, mm -hmm. it would be good to know that they spoke Welsh and they may not be answering phones, but they might be someone I needed to communicate with. So I, I don't see why there should be a differentiation in, in the directory. Thank you, Councillor Reynolds. Uh, Anita? Yeah, that is something I think we can look at, Councillor Reynolds. I, I think the point is that because they're not, they're not um, maybe contactable easily, um, because they're not on email or they're not on a work phone. So because they're out on the front line, so they could be uh, refuse operatives, they could be um, in the school catering services, um, etc. So I think they, there isn't an easy way to actually contact them as a Welsh speaker, but I will double check that that, that is right. Um, but I think that's probably why they're not on there. Um, but we could look at maybe how we report that, I think, going forward. Is that okay, Councillor Reynolds? Thank you. Uh, thank you for all those answers, uh, Anita. Um, are there any more questions on this? I get, hang on, I can see one on, on the board a second. Uh, could I have Councillor Rebecca Phillips, please? Yeah, diolch, Dave. It's just, just a quick comment, really. I diolch, it's in Ireland, I'm, I'm the Salwadai. Um, you know, I know we're bringing Welsh speaking officers, especially somebody as passionate um, over the Welsh language as Norwegian really does help us as an authority to make progress and move forward. Um, and I agree with Sean that it'd be great um, to see the Welsh language used more, you know, in the chamber. When I was first elected back in 2012, we couldn't use the Welsh language at all in the chamber. So we have made progress, albeit being very slow progress. Um, and I'm sure we all look forward to um, your work on this Norwegian. So Diolch and Valdes here. Thank you. Thank you for those comments, uh, Councillor Phillips and uh, Nolwyn's taking them uh, on board. He's giving the nod next to me. Uh, next up, I've got Councillor Charlotte Goldsworthy, please. Um, I, um, obviously, as a Northern Welsh speaker, um, and I actually find the language very difficult. Um, like many people, it's not the easiest. I find Spanish easier than Welsh, not that I'm fluent in Spanish, before you all know, right? Maybe in four weeks, I might be, never know. But um, to be honest with you, over the years, they have ploughed millions and millions, Welsh Commissioner, everything into the Welsh language. And um, in a previous role with Tata, we had over 700 people on a list to learn Welsh in Tata Steel. And when they, all, they were all really keen, in fairness, Welsh language, you know, patriotic, with pride, everything. But at the end of the day, the only one person that actually went on to like level two, level three, was a Chinese graduate and he was fluent by the end of it and because it's they just found it very difficult and everything else so I, again I know you know my own daughter in social services they um there's one the speaker there they speak about going and ordering jacket potatoes and things like that but like as I said to her what happens when you get to the shop because if they're not a Welsh speaker in the shop then you can't order a jack potato in Welsh. So there's a lot of things and lots of barriers, not just in the workplace, but as, the, you know, they're helping or whatever and excited about it. But again, when we are actually looking at the current state of everything at the moment, we're on food banks, we haven't got enough money for various services and, you know, all these different provisions in our communities and everything else. Where is, where is, is there any sort of point where, Basically, we still look and we're not actually growing the Welsh language. There's not more people coming on board. We've got 
loads of members of staff that haven't said they were speakers, but they've been to, you know, the Welsh schools all their lives, but they just don't speak it. So how then, as a local authority, are we still going to be prioritising time and money into the language? Is that going to be a priority over frontline services, social services, education, you know, things like that? And, and you know, that's what I'm sort of, you know, you know, I'd love to speak the language, but I don't. Thank you, uh, Councillor Goldsworthy. I think, without Steve and Noel Winston the first, I think it comes back to what I said earlier on. I think this is a long, long-term plan, isn't it? And that um, there's no doubt, I think, it's far easier to learn an, a second language when you're a lot younger. And it, it, people are starting to have uh, biling, bilingual childcare and things like that now. So hopefully, as it comes through, you know, the children in 20 years' time will hopefully be bilingual anyway. And I think you, we will have more use. But it's that interim, I think. But uh, I'll hand over to Noel Wynn then, please. Yeah, Dios You know, in terms of your final points there, Council goes with you around, uh, you know, priorities and spend that clearly, you know, is a conversation and decision that will be taken by ourselves as, as elected members. Your Welsh Government have set a target of a million Welsh speakers by 2050. And I think, you know, the work and the excellent work has taken place in East Patalbert with Andrew Thomas's director around WESP. You know, it's all about ensuring that, um, you, people learn to speak Welsh from a very young age, from school age, clearly. And, and the intention of the 2050 target is, is there for a reason. And the intention is to increase, you know, the number of Welsh speakers and the number of Welsh uh, bilingual schools we have within our authority and across Wales, um, because the intention is that they will be immersed and embedded within the Welsh language. And it, it comes naturally when you're that young. It's much harder when you're when you're an adult to learn to learn any other language. So hence why there's such an importance and a need for investment around WESP and around our Welsh language um, provisions within our education sector, because that is how we will reach that, that 2050 target. Um, and as somebody who, who kind of grew up in Pont de Prith as, as in, in school um, at the time I was there in, in late 70s, won't give away too much, um, there was only one Welsh secondary education school in, in, in South Wales. Um, you know, now there's about seven, nine or ten secondary Welsh schools in, in South Wales. So we are increasing the number of Welsh speakers at, at, at an early age, and those are the ones that will allow us to get towards our 2050 target. But I think what's important is that we create the culture and the environment within the organisation so that we, anybody who is trying to learn Welsh, we set up some, you know, culture, clack or whatever we want to call them, so people feel comfortable in starting to use the Welsh language. Yeah. Thank you, Noel. And uh, I have an indication. Councillor Noel, please. Thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to pick up and, and in no way dilute what we're talking about now. Um, the Welsh language comes under me as well as finance. Moving forward, we are certainly going to have to have those difficult conversations about spend and how we do these things that we want to do, like the Welsh language and integrate it into more of our council activities against our budget. I don't want to dilute it. My, my daughter and my wife are both fluent Welsh speakers. I'm not. Um, but it's certainly something we need to we need to find that balance on going forward. Yeah, OK. Thank you, Charlotte. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, uh, Councillor Noel. Are, are you happy with the responses? Uh, thank you, uh, Councillor Goldsworthy. Um, if there are no more questions, um, this report is for noting. Uh, OK, so we'll, we'll duly note the report. Moving along to Agenda Item 6B, the Revenue Budget Monitoring Report for 2024-2025. Um, can I hand over to Hugh, I believe. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Dioch. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, so this is the Revenue Budget Monitoring Report that's at the end of June 2024. Um, just to give members an indication of what officers do, they take income and expenditure to that point in time um, and then project forward to the end of March to see where um, we think we'll be at the end of the year, taking it into account and what we know about changes to services, et cetera, over the duration of the year. As at the end of June, we are forecasting at the moment a projected overspend um, across the whole council of £1.8 million. Um, the report contains details by directorate of various um, underspends and overspends um, and is followed by a schedule of um, the savings that were included in this year's budget, which are um, RAG rated, red, amber, green. Um, and a schedule of the council's reserves. So I'm um, happy to move to questions, Chair. Dioch, thank you. Many thanks, Hugh. Uh, we'll now move to members' questions. I've had a couple of indications already from pre-briefing, and the first up I've got is Councillor Paddison, please. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, yes, I'm one of those that really um, finds the red, amber, green, you know, 
valuable in the first instance. It's a, it's a guideline to start asking questions. But um, what I raised in pre-briefing was there are so many amber that what what I would like is is it amber nearly there or amber no chance you know the, the degrees of within the amber uh, because we have to monitor how we go in and um, basically that's it Hugh. Thanks. Okay so thank you so just to explain if they're green, it means as at the end of June, they've already been achieved, they're in the bag, so they have, they, they're they done for the year. If they're amber, officers are confident that by the end of March, we'll be able to achieve the savings, but they haven't been achieved as yet. If you think it would be helpful, we can add a comment along each one. Right, that, that's, yeah, okay, thank you, Councillor Patterson. That, that's, that's, what I, that's what they mean. Lovely, thanks, Hugh. And then, uh, I've got other indications first, please. Um, I've got Councillor Reynolds, please. Thank you. Um, I've I've got questions about the overspends in education. Um, I and I also wanted to ask whether we have any information at this point in time about the uh, current level or anticipated level of school uh, school reserves because that impacts then on on the, the our wider budget on how schools are using those budgets um i there are things in this like there's a lot of overspend in education um several several of the categories and in other areas uh, of our activity in other departments mention under unachieved vacancy targets now i realize this is you know till june um but we're all aware of the stresses on staff at the moment, staff shortages, the impact that's having. And if we're not achieving vacancy targets at this point, is there a, an ongoing issue? And what is the impact of achieving those going to have on the stresses uh, on staff going forward? In addition, I have, a, a for example, the country park spend on both Margam and uh, hang on, not Margam and the Knoll. No, other other country parks and then specifically the Knoll. Um, we're looking at uh, an, a report till the end of June, which refutes, references reasons coming from August, which confused me utterly. So how does the closure of a cafe in August relate to the end of June report? Um, it was it that's just you know it just i bent my mind around it and couldn't work it out thank you councillor reynolds uh who yeah, okay take it up, please yeah thank you chair so in terms of um schools um you will note on page 99 of the report uh pack that it says that schools are predicted to um, increase their deficits by 7.6 million pound um by the end of the financial year um, the chief executive and myself have met with Mr. Andrew Thomas and his colleagues to try and get an understanding of um, what can be done to mitigate that. Um, and there is a report on the cabinet schedule, I believe, for later on in the year, and where members will be provided with more information about that. So that's the position around schools at the moment. Um, in terms of the vacancy management, each director was given a 5% target. Um, and it's up to them to achieve that across the directorates. So in some areas, they will underachieve the target, for example, in areas where um, they can't carry vacancies. So, for example, school cleaning, if there's a vacancy, it's got to be filled. But they will overachieve the target um, in other areas, for example. So overall, we are confident that the 5% vacancy target um, will be achieved across the directorates. Um, in terms of pressure on staff, this is the second year we've had that target. I've not heard any feedback through um, director colleagues that staff are saying they're under pressure because of the vacancy target. So I don't think that's an issue at this point in time. But if anybody else wants to come in on that, um, feel free to do so. In terms of the question around the Knoll Country Park, as I said in my introduction, what colleagues will do is take the information at the end of June and then predict what they know going forward to predict where we think we're going to be at the end of March. So it's at the end of June. We know that the cafe in the Knoll is going to close in August, so therefore we will take into account the fact there'll be no income for a duration of time, which gives us the end of year forecast, which is what appears in the report. So 
hopefully that's a helpful explanation. I think it covers um, all the questions raised. Thank you, Dioch. Thank you, Hugh. Councillor Ellis, would you like to come back? So what we're saying on that last one, Hugh, just so that I understand, um, you know, it's a report to the end of June. However, the the figures that I'm looking at here here on the, on the on the narrative relate to a projection for the end of the year. Absolutely spot on. Yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Hugh. Thank you, Councillor Ellis. Yeah. Um, next up, I have Councillor Sean Percy, please. Uh, dear Cadeo, thank you. Um, two questions from me. Um, one is in relation to um, the item on public LinkedIn referred to on page 102. Um, and linked to that, the uh, RAG table on page 108. Um, so on page 102, there's um, a re reference to the 220k um, uh, reduction saving um, is unlikely that the full saving will be achieved due to um, uh, pricing prices not decreasing. Um, but it is currently shown as a green on the RAG table in terms of the 220k saving. So I don't know if somebody can explain whether there's a sort of extra things going on in the narrative um, on page 102. Because what I wasn't 100% sure about is whether the um, saving not being achieved was referring to the dimming or the general price of energy. And maybe that's why there's a discrepancy. So I don't know if um, somebody could explain that to me. Thank you, Councillor Percy. We'll bring here we are on this one, yeah. please. Thank you, Chair. Yes, good question, Councillor Percy. So the saving in relation to dimming has been achieved in terms of the usage, the energy usage, et cetera, of the, of the lights. However, because the price hasn't come down as much as we thought, it's still showing as an overspend. So we've put the RAG rate in as green because actually what we said we're going to do in terms of reducing consumption has happened. But in the main body of the report, it's showing as an overspend because as you referenced, it's the actual price of the you said price of the units, not the usage. I hope that makes sense. I, if it doesn't, I got Mike Roberts on the call who can probably maybe answer it in a bit more articulate way than me. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Percy, are you happy with that? Uh, well, to a point, I'm just not sure that the rag table is sort of accurately can reflect the full picture there. Um, in the sense, if you kind of look at that and look at that green, okay, we've 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 we're on track with public light in, but then actually something else has happened that's kind of undermined that savings proposal, isn't it? And I'm not sure where green is really the right colour <laughs> to put on yeah, it. it I, probably needs I, to be... I think that's a that's a fair point and probably something we'll take on board for um, future reports if we're still projecting an overspend in that service area at that point in time. So, yeah, take on board. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Percy. Dior. Thank you. Well, uh, Councillor Percy, I believe you had another question as well. Yeah. Yes. The, the, so the other question is in relation to the only... Um, red item on the report, which is um, the technical infrastructure modernization in digital services um, with Chris Owen. Um, and it's the, the only comment is that the energy budget does not sit with digital services. I'm trying to understand whether this is still going ahead um, or not, and for, for, for what the explanation is behind that sort of red item. Yeah, thank you, Coach. Please bring you again. Thank yeah, you. so perhaps I would be better off expanding on that comment in the report. So so what we did when we came up with these savings proposals is we assigned uh, Chris a saving of £29,000 because he was going to do the work in relation to this um, Im improving power consumption and things like that. But actually, the budget for the for power sits with Environment Directorate. So Chris is not going to achieve the saving in his budget because he never had the budget in the first place. But the work is going to go ahead and probably has gone ahead and the saving will be achieved, but it will be achieved elsewhere. So is that saving being achieved elsewhere is not reflected in this RAG analysis because it's somewhere else, and Chris is not going to achieve it, if that makes any sense. Yeah, thank you. Does that make sense to you, uh, Councillor Percy? Yeah. Yeah, but, well, conversely, I think this this uh, red one should be green. <laughs> yeah, when, when I was saying that, I thought it doesn't make sense to me. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I'm, I'm glad the saving has been. What, what what it looked like on the face of it was that sort of Chris kind of said, well, I'm not going to get the savings out of this, so I'm not going to spend the money is kind of what it reads as. And I thought, well, that, that, I'm sure that's not what's happened. But um, so I'm glad of the explanation. I'm glad the investment's happened. Um, yeah, that one perhaps should be green. Deal. 
Yeah, th- thank you, Councillor Percy. I think perhaps, but perhaps that uh, reference should be transferred to a different area, perhaps, and uh, we'll aggregate it then when we get it from environment. I think that might be an idea, but uh, I think we see what's going on. Um, uh, looking around for any other questions, I think Councillor Goldsworthy would like to come in. I think it's actually commendable, really, in the sense of the work which actually has been done. In 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 one sense, is the savings. It's because obviously there's something that's not in our control has actually popped up. Um, you know, but the thinking behind it, I think, is 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 really good because it is, you know, innovative sort of way of thinking and that. Um, again, it's like sometimes we think of a cost and we're not looking at the savings, which is the preventative work is going on against it. So I think, you know, that would have been showing if we hadn't put their measures in place as a bigger overspend. So I think that should be on record for that. Um, my question <laughs> is because I'm having complaints daily about it is the school transport um the bit on the overspend there i think it's page 99 um obviously with um the home school transport obviously in the overspend and that taking into account many of the complaints that have come in um obviously before the summer holidays broke up there was people you know people who contacted the lack of communication um, and everything, and obviously most of this is to do with people with um, uh, spe- special needs um, children, and so they've got enough obviously pressures going on without obviously us adding to it. Obviously, it says but there about the review team, which obviously is a consultancy. So my question is, what has that consultancy actually done where our staff couldn't do it? Because working closely with the team back last year. Um, they were actually moving towards, obviously, a lot of this. So, therefore, if our team could have done that work anyway, what would the spends or the overspends have actually been if we hadn't used that agency? Because I'm not actually seeing or hearing the worth of the agency at the moment. Um, So, therefore, how much did that agency cost us to carry out that work? That, in my own opinion, the team could have done it. And therefore, so is is them figures then? Could that could have been a greater saving? Right, you just just come in now, obviously, because this question has just arisen. And remember, we said that we might not be able to get the answers on the day if it's just arisen. Are we are we happy to take it? Who? Yeah, yeah, we'll okay, over to who, please. Yeah. So so just in relation to the overspend specifically, that's because um, new home to school transport routes have had to be put in place for new children in effect since the budget was set. So that's the reason for that overspend. In terms of the rest of your question, I'll ask Craig to give some advice maybe around whether that's something for this scrutiny committee or for a different one. So, Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Hugh. What I would stress, Councillor Goldsworthy, is obviously the points that you're making here go to something greater than probably the budgetary savings elements and, and what's been included here, which, which Hugh was answering today. So what I would suggest, if this is something that members want to take forward, we actually do it in via the scrutiny committee, which is the, the environment scrutiny committee. That's where the school transport contracts ultimately vest with the responsibility for. So I think because the nature of the question is about what benefit do the new arrangements bring in, it tends to go more into the performance related aspects, which sits under the purview of that committee whether it's just the financial bits which he was going to be bringing here today. So something we can certainly pick up. And if you want to take that forward, Councillor Percy, maybe something he might speak to him about and how we involve the committee then in that regard as well. Yes. And if I can just come back, Chair. um, Yeah, I'm all for that. But again, um, what I'd like to see is the the actual service uh, and the communication between parents and that obviously looked into what has actually gone wrong this time to prevent that, obviously, in future years uh, coming as well. Yeah. So that would be education, I think, would it? Actually, no, because school transport arrangements itself and the, the passenger transport service sits in the Environment Directorate, it would be that particular scrutiny committee that leads on that. Obviously, there is a cross-reference to education in that sense. So if there are things that are intrigued on both, we might have to look at the best way for it to be considered. But ultimately, I think the foundation of it is regard to the provision of the service. So that would be environment-led. Yeah, that brilliant. Way. Lovely, thank Lovely. you. Thank you. Okay, uh, Councillor Goldsworthy. Yep, thank you. Thank you, uh, Craig. Uh, Councillor Reynolds, please. There was, um, whether it was before this changed over to environment or or whether it was it just came to us because there is a large impact on school transport, on the schooling and learning of these young people, um, a long discussion in, in scrutiny committee with education on 
this contract and and the changes that were planned. Um, at that time, the questions asked were quite clearly about the value for money of uh, in, in the definition that we were talking about earlier um, of being true value for money of having consultants in when we all anybody who's worked with consultants know that unless they're incredibly skilled and well versed in in what they're doing what they end up doing is picking the brains of everybody around them and then regurgitating that information back we've all been in that circumstance and i've been a consultant myself i know how it's done um <laughs> so we uh, uh, we have to we we have to look closely at the value of this contract and at the value of of consultancy contracts across the board going forward, um, and believe that it is better to use the skills of our own staff more appropriately. And I'd rather employ people than spend money further outside. And it is it's something which does need cross referencing to the education committee. And I'm sure that. Uh, Councillor Phillips would agree with me. Thank you, Councillor Reynolds. I'm, I'm sure we're all listening in. I know a number of are on different committees, so uh, it will come forward at a future date. Thank you. Are there any other questions on this item, then, please? I can't see an indication. Uh, this report, again, is just for noting, unless Councillor Noyle would like to add anything. No? Okay, thank you. Uh, Moving along then, agenda item 6C, this one's the capital budget monitoring for 2024-25. Um, who? Yeah, thank you very much, Chair. So this is the um, capital budget monitoring report, um, which is due for Cabinet next week. Um, contains um, details around changes to the capital programme since it was set um, back in Council in March. So we started off with a capital programme of 81.9 million. That's now reduced slightly to 77.9. Um, details of changes are summarised in the report and are detailed further uh, in a appendix to the report, Chair, um, along with um, details of spend for some of the major projects um, by the end of June. Um, in the last um, Community Finance and Strategic, Le Re Strategic Leadership Committee, um, there was a reference to the fact that there were lots of headings of other budgets. So what colleagues have done now is broken those down into further detail uh, so members are cited on on more detail in terms of the capital program delivery so i mean it was councillor jones who was here last time who, who mentioned that so hopefully when you get a chance to read these reports we'll, we'll take on board the fact we've made uh, the changes you requested um and happy to take any questions chair Dioch. many thanks you yeah it has been noted about the uh, lots more headings fair play um we'll move to members questions now i have only one indication at the moment and that's councillor reynolds please I, I just wanted, and I, as I mentioned uh, in the Declaration of Interests, to pick up on the shared, pros shared Prosperity Fund. My mouth isn't quite behaving itself today. And what concerns me there is the uh, is getting that expenditure out. I am very aware that whilst the reports go on our financial year, um, the Shared Prosperity Fund at the current time needs to be spent by December, um, unless I've missed something in the, and that many of these projects struggle to start up. And, and I'm wondering, you know, whether there is a view that we are going to manage to spend this money because we do not want to give it back. Yeah, fair point, uh, Councillor Reynolds. Uh, over to you, please. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so in terms of the Shared Prosperity Fund projects, um, we've recently had um, an indication that we've now got until the end of February to spend the money, so that's obviously helpful. Still not a very long time um, to spend them, because as you referenced, they were late starting. Um, the indications that I've had from the people managing the specific projects are that they will be spent um, by February. What we do have with SPF, which is um, very helpful, is the ability to move money around between um, projects and between revenue and capital as well. So um, colleagues in Lisa Willis's team and Environment Directorate are absolutely on the case in trying to make sure we maximise spend. The last thing we want to do is give any money back um, to anybody, so we will try our very best to make sure we ensure that doesn't happen, Chair. 
but I do take on board that at the moment there are very low, well, as at the end of June, there are very low spends on those individual projects, Chair, but um, have some comfort. We are actually trying to do as much as we can to get spend up the door. Many thanks, Sue. Yeah, that's quite encouraging. Councillor yeah. Reynolds, are you happy? I just wanted to ask if it's extended to the end of February, is that all SPF? N nothing's confirmed as yet, so that's just an indication we've had um, at the moment from um, UK government that um, yes, we, whether it's all projects or whether it's ones we're delivering ourselves, I'm not sure, but I can certainly get somebody to confirm that with you, Councillor Reynolds. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Reynolds. Just to say, I am really pleased now on a totally different tack to see the spending that's taking place finally after long delays because of COVID on the Pontedary Arts Centre. Thank you, Councillor Reynolds. Are there any other questions on this particular item, please? I can't see any yet. So, um, for this one, the recommendation is listed on page 120 of the agenda pack. I'm happy to propose it. Can I have a seconder, please? Happy to second, sure. Thank you, Councillor Henton. Can members please indicate if they wish to abstain? I can see no abstentions, Chair. Thank you, Alison. Members, if you do not indicate to the contrary, then I will take it that this recommendation is supported. I can see no indications to the contrary, Chair, so the recommendation is supported. Many thanks, Alison. Moving along, agenda item 6D, the Treasury Management Outturn. Um, Councillor Noyle or Hill, would you like to add anything more? Yeah, yeah. just to add, Chair, there's, there's a um, typo on the agenda. It's not an outturn report. It's actually the monitoring report as at the end of June. So the, so the agenda is incorrect there. The outturn report was considered at the last scrutiny meeting. Um, in terms of the actual report itself, it is a standard monitoring report which details Treasury Management activity for the first quarter of the year, um, details the investments that we currently hold um, and other sort of related issues. Um, so happy to take questions, Chair. Thank you. Dioch. Thanks, Hugh. Um, we'll move to members' questions. Uh, at the pre-briefing, we didn't have any indication of any questions on, on this particular item this time. Uh, any members wish to bring anything up uh, at this stage? OK, I can, can't see any indication. Um, so this report is for noting, so it's duly noted, OK? Moving on to part four, uh, this is agenda item seven, selection of items for full uh, for future scrutiny, sorry, which is listed on pages 155 to 174 of our, re our report. Yeah, uh, This is to go through the forward work programme and add any further items which members may wish to consider. Um, I think I'm going to bring Craig in at this point, please. Thank you, Chair. Just a point specifically for me. I know there was an issue that was raised at one of our forward work programme sessions regarding transport arrangements we were going to look at. Just to assure members that work is ongoing in hand to try and work out the way in which ultimately we're going to be looking to do this. It's a little bit complex for a number of reasons because it crosses the strands of various different scrutiny committees. There's work which is ongoing within the corporate joint committee, obviously, in respect of regional transport strategies as well. So it's trying to work out the best way ultimately in which we can do it. So I need to have a discussion with the chairs and vice chairs of scrutiny to which would be the best way to resolve this, which I'll do at the next meeting. My intention then would be to bring a report back where we establish a task and finish group to basically look at some terms of reference about what it is we actually want to look at and develop this. It's an incredibly wide range in topic, so I'm conscious of the fact that we need to try and make this direct and we need to try and make sure what it's going to cover you to get the best use of officer time and member time as part of this. So the proposal, Chair, is whilst we're still trying to iron out some of these details, once that's done, I'll bring that report to create the task and finish group and we can work out then what members actually want to look at and develop it from that. Many thanks, Craig. Um, I'm going to bring Alison in for a, a little bit of update on our forward work programme as well, please. Thank you, Chair. I know that members are aware there's been a few changes to the scrutiny forward work programme. So just to confirm, the reports which were due today but have now been pushed back into the 17th of October include the Corporate Plan Annual Report 23-24, the Self-Assessment 23-24, the Public Participation Strategy for 23-27 to and the Strategic <coughs> Equality Plan Annual Report 23-24. So with the Chair's agreement, they've all been put on the October agenda for scrutiny. I also note that in the pre-briefing, members asked if there was a clearer way we could put on the Cabinet Forward Work Programme any updates to it. So we fed this back to our executive officers and I'm assured that at the next meeting there will be a clear indication on the Cabinet Forward Work Programme of any updates since this meeting. So going forward, members should be able to see easily where there have been updates to the Cabinet Forward Work Programme. But I've got no further updates at this time, Chair. Many thanks, Alison. 
I think we'll move uh, to uh, some questions, indication of people who'd like to speak at this point. And the first up is Councillor Suzanne Patterson, please. Volume. I think it was on volume. Uh, of reading. Of reading. The volume of reading. Yeah. yeah thank you. Yes. Um, I do apologise for my lack of awareness there. Um, yes. I just wanted to um, ask the chair in the pre-briefing I did ask the chair in the pre-briefing are you keeping an eye on the volume because one of the reasons that we had the change to scrutiny arrangements was because there was lots of volume in the scrutiny committees and it was supposed to reduce the number of I of decision items in any one particular what was then cabinet scrutiny and I can't remember what we call it now so um, that was the question. Uh, the chair did assure me that he was keeping an eye on it. So d is there an update on that? But that's all I did is that I'm glad you brought it up. I wanted to bring it up in public as well so that uh, we're all aware of what's going right on. Right then. All right. So um, I, I don't think there's anything else to say on there. Or oh, Craig, if you'd like to come back in. Uh, just a one point to add, um, members will be seeing in their diary if, if they haven't seen them yet. There are some sessions over the next couple of weeks where we're looking at some scrutiny procedural rules training and various aspects in respect of scrutiny. It's those types of issues which are just trying to iron out there if members have got concerns in respect of volume, complexity or whatever the case may be. So we can try and put some plans in place to help try and address that. What we're conscious of at the moment, we're still in the very early days of our current new, way of, of new model of scrutiny. So we need to see how it's going to roll out and develop as time goes on. But we're going to try and address some of those potential issues at an early stage so hopefully within those sections members have the opportunity to address any concerns and we know then we can try and address them as we go forward many thanks craig is that okay you yeah. thank you councillor patterson uh the next indication i have is from councillor reynolds please thank you um just to thank craig for his input on the on the transport issue i find myself aware of things going on and discussions going on on transport of different aspects of it, all of which impact on, you know, community development and building and work that, you know, is going on in in the communities around me and that affect my residents that I can't get to every single one of and I can't keep track of where these different themes are going in different places, yet they're all connected. They're all about how people access our services and move things through and I think that's the focus for this it's about access it's about people being able to get where they need to go um, but there are other issues tied into that discussion which are about uh, the barriers that we're finding so for example you can't have an active travel route from one from your valley community into uh, Pontadawi for me just to give that example, but it's other communities as well. And I know it happens in other valleys um, because your population density isn't enough. You don't fit the criteria. You're not so. And then you can't have housing in your local area because you haven't got transport. You haven't got public transport. You haven't got active travel routes. So you're caught in this whole thing and, and it's an attempt to say how do we bring those things together in one place as opposed to saying we're going to deal with school transport and here we're going to deal with bus franchising and here we're going to deal with active transport and and then we've got this grant which is community transport and then we've got you know and then we've got licensing which is taxes and you know it's it we just need to go okay how can we make a strategy around this. Thank you, Councillor Reynolds. I'm, I'm sure that we just reiterate what Craig has said, is that we, they're looking into um, the current way we're going to do that, but I'm sure it will come forward uh, shortly, I would have thought, when, we, when we've got our head round how uh, everyone's going to be involved. Thank you. Councillor Percy, please. Yeah, Claire, thanks, Chair. Just, yeah, just, just on that note, obviously this transport um, that does does sit sort of wholly within the, the scrutiny committee um, that I chair. So I, I, I might be worth um, me having a chat with with Craig um, in terms of the thinking of, of what is going to be put together, because it, I think it might be it would be um, complicated if we started um, duplicating scrutiny work from one committee into another. 
Um, so um, I, I think it'd be worth us having a chat um, just to make sure whether you know it's not crossing into work that we're planning to do or have done or are doing in the Environment Scrutiny Committee. Yeah. Thank you, Councillor Percy. Bring Craig in, please. Yeah, absolutely, Councillor Percy. And I think that's the intention of bringing this to the chairs and vice chairs because there are themes that go into various different scrutiny committees in that regard. So we do need to look at what would be the best approach ultimately to take if this is something that members want to proceed with. So um, we could have a chairs and vice chairs meeting hopefully in the next couple of weeks and then we can use that as a basis so I can sound everyone out at one time and then we have something then to bring back. Thank you, uh, Craig. Uh, Councillor Patterson, please. Just to give a shout out that um, obviously... It's not a scrutiny committee, but planning comes into this big time. So um, we need, if there's any aspects of, of transport that are decided upon strategies, um, members in planning need to be up to speed as well, even though they're not scrutiny. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Patterson. Yeah, duly noted, I think. OK. Are there any other... Uh, comments or questions on this particular item, please. Councillor Reynolds. Can I ask as well, if urgent items are to go to Cabinet that haven't been on the forward work programme, if uh, all members can be notified that they're going to Cabinet because they, they could be from any scrutiny area? I think we know. I think we know did that. Yeah, well, great. Good. Um, yes, it's one of the things we've been talking about in our sessions this morning. We're fine tuning our forward work plan at the moment to make it a very live document, so it will have information on there. And when things like updates are made to it, it will be pushed out to members like it would be when um, frequency when members of um, new reports are being published, like we would on the ModGov system. So it's a little bit of work in progress at the moment, but we're looking to develop a system that basically gets all that information out in real time, ultimately for members as well, because it's an ever changing system, as you can imagine trying to pull our things together. Lovely. Thanks, Craig. That's uh, quite reassuring, to be honest, I think. Yeah. Thank you. Are there any other questions or comments at this point? Okay. Thank you all for that. That's uh, that's the selection of items for future scrutiny, uh, which leaves me with uh, agenda item eight. Uh, any urgent items at the discretion of the chairperson pursuant to section 100BA6B of the Local Government Act 1972 as amended? And you'll be pleased to hear as always, I do not have any urgent items at this point. Thank you all for all your contributions and for joining us this afternoon. And uh, thank you for all those who've uh, responded to all the questions asked as well. OK, so thank you all and uh, have a lovely evening. Thanks all. Thank you.